we come to Acts chapter 9, and this is the conversion, of, as I've already told you, of uh, the Pharisee Saul. And uh, Lord willing, I'm going to refer to him as Saul throughout the, the text. Um, and I, I, one thing we need to realize is that God did not really change his name. It's not that he was Saul the Pharisee who becomes Paul the Apostle. Uh, it is. I mean, that does happen. But um, he really had both names. Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his Greek name. And uh, he's referred to as, I think if I was Saul, I would probably want to be referred to as Paul. Also, after this change that takes place in my life by God's grace. But that's really the main thing we want to see is that change uh, that does take place. So let me begin by reading the text. And let me also say this too. I, I really had started uh, with the idea that I was going to deal with this all the way through to the, the transformation that we see in him preaching the gospel but just ran out of room. The sermon got too big. So I'm going to leave that part for next time. So what we're going to look at is Acts 9, verses 1 through 19, Saul's awakening, Saul's conversion. Okay. Now, Luke writes, beginning in verse 1, Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. I'll just stop the reading there, even though the verse has a little bit more. It really fits with what goes on next. Well, may the Lord bless his word again to instruct us and to build us up into the image of Christ. Now, last week uh, we saw Philip had finished his ministry in Samaria, but the Lord had not yet finished with him. As he was headed back to Jerusalem, an angel told him to go south for a divinely ordained meeting, and Philip went without question. You know, there's, there's something that Martin Luther once said that always strikes me. He said this, and it sounds rather... Um, I don't know, bizarre, maybe a bit crude. He said, if the Lord told me to eat the dung off the street, I would eat it and know it was good for me. Now, what he had in mind, of course, was not that God was going to tell him to do absurd things, uh, perhaps even things that would be grotesque to this, uh, to this level. But what he was re re uh, really relaying was his absolute submission to the Lord that he has the right to tell me what to do. And whatever he tells me, even if I don't understand it at the time, I know is going to be good. And certainly that was the case here. 
Philip didn't know why the Lord called him to go, but he went, and what he found was a caravan of a very important man, the treasurer of the Queen of Ethiopia, who was returning to his country after worshiping in Jerusalem. Remember, Philip came near the chariot, heard him reading the apostle Isaiah, realizing that this was a providentially ordered opportunity, he used it to preach the gospel to him, and the Lord graciously saved that man. Now, again, here is an example of God's sovereignty in conversion. He sent the angel to redirect Philip to this official. His spirit moved on the heart of the official to be reading that particular passage in Isaiah. And when Philip preached the gospel message from that passage, the Lord changed this man's heart and brought him to Jesus. The Lord is the one who brings us to himself. It's not the other way around. Even though we do have our part to play, the Lord might awaken us as we're going to see. We might seek after the Lord. But he's the one who ultimately gives us his Holy Spirit. As we've already seen in Ephesians, and as we have already read in Romans, it is absolutely necessary that God do that because of the impossibility of our ever coming to Jesus in the state we are in by nature. We cannot do it. Okay. Now, this was not only the first Gentile who was saved, it was also the first among a class of men who until that time had been excluded from the congregation of the Lord. God was now beginning to fulfill His plan to bring salvation to all people everywhere, even from the ends of the earth. Remember, He brought the Ethiopian the eunuch from Ethiopia. That's a long ways away. After the man was baptized, he returned home, now as a missionary. The Lord used him not only to convert the queen of Ethiopia, but many others as well. And it's believed that the man actually died as a martyr serving the Lord. Now, again, I just want to remind us from that example of the Ethiopian eunuch that this is what the Lord is after in our conversion. It isn't merely to rescue us. Merely. I, he does rescue us, but not merely to rescue us, but that he might use us to rescue others. And so then he takes Philip, the Spirit takes him to Azotus, and again we see Philip doing what it is God had also saved and called him to do. He began to work his way northward, preaching through the cities until he came to Caesarea. Now this morning, Luke turns our attention to another God-ordained conversion, that of Saul. You know, there's one sense in which Saul was really not that much different from the Ethiopian, really. The Ethiopian was a God-fearer. He believed in the God of the Jews. He worshiped God according to the law of God, according to his commandment. Well, Saul was a Pharisee who held to the same belief system, and he worshiped in the same way. So they were very similar, but there was also a remarkable difference. <laughs> Unlike the official, Saul had a deep hatred for the church and for her Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ so much so that he was willing even to go to other cities to arrest Christians and to bring them back to Jerusalem in order to stand trial, I think in his estimation, hoping that if they didn't repent of what he considered to be a heresy, that they would be put to death. We know he was already in favor of Stephen's death. Uh, he was the one, the young man who watched the coats of those who went out to stone him. But as we know, the Lord had other plans. He was intending to turn Saul's heart, and by turning his heart, those energies that Saul had by which he was trying to destroy the church, he was going to turn those energies into another direction to begin to build up the very thing that he now wanted to destroy. What we see in our passage this morning is the conversion of the Lord's apostle to the Gentiles. And again, not just to the Gentiles. Gentile kings, Jewish kings, Jewish people as well. But I think we generally attribute um, uh, Paul as his main work among the Gentiles. So I want us to consider two things this morning. First of all, Saul's awakening. And secondly, his conversion. And again, I realize that as we go through this text, it's difficult to tell where he's awakened and where, when he's actually converted. So we may not know for certain. We're just going to kind of take this tack. We do know one thing, he was awakened and he was converted. So first of all, we see Saul's awakening. We see the Lord get his attention, arrest his attention. Now Saul, as you likely know, was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Jew. 
and uh, perhaps named after the first king of Israel, although I'm not sure why any of them would want to be named after Saul because he was not a righteous king. But as I mentioned before too, Paul was his Roman name. And it's interesting that Saul may have some grandiose overtones because it was the name of, of this king who was you know, a head taller than everyone else of great stature and power, at least for a while. Paul essentially means just the opposite. It means small. It means humble. The name was actually used to distinguish the younger of two persons in one family who shared the same name. So if you had an older and a younger, then you would use Paulus to describe the younger. Today we use the term junior, I think. Well, he was born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia. He was born a free Roman citizen. He was educated first in the schools of Tarsus, and then we know he was a student in Jerusalem under Gamaliel because he was a Pharisee. And we know he was a very zealous member of that sect. Paul was also a tent maker. That wasn't something he took up when he went on his missionary journey. Uh, Lightfoot tells us that this was really a common trade of scholars in that day. It allowed them to earn a living. I think most people who go through college have to work while they're doing it, and so Paul did as well, or Saul. Uh, it allowed him to be able to pay for the education, to pay for his livelihood, and to avoid something that all religious zealots want to avoid, and that is idleness. Idleness is bad for anyone. It's never good to have nothing to do because we usually find something bad to use with that time. We need to, you know, use the time for the Lord's glory. Now, Luke shows us what this man was actually like before the Lord changed him. This was his nature. This was his desire. And I think we need to get a good, clear picture of that. Otherwise, we might tend to think that Saul just simply decided not to be like Saul on one particular day when he met the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not something he did. This is something the Lord does. We read in verses 1 and 2. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, Paul, the Apostle Paul, later tells Timothy in his first letter regarding himself that he was a blasphemer and a persecutor of Christ and His church. But it was because he was the worst that God had mercy on him so that others could be encouraged through his example that God would also or could also have mercy on them. Now, you've probably heard this expression before, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe it sincerely. <laughs> I think it does matter what you believe, doesn't it? Saul was very sincere in his belief system. He wanted to destroy Christianity. And because of his heart and because of this evil in his heart and because of his hatred of Christ, he was actually on his way to a very terrible judgment. It does matter what you believe even if you believe it sincerely. Now, earlier we saw him ravaging the church in Jerusalem. Here we see he is determined to stamp out this heresy also in Damascus. Damascus was 136 miles away from Jerusalem. That's a long way to travel if you have to go by horseback, camel, usually walking. And in this case, he was going by horseback. Now, the gospel had either been taking, taken there by converts on the day of Pentecost or perhaps through the efforts of the disciples who fled Jerusalem because of Saul's persecution. I mean, it may have been Saul's fault that it actually spread that, that far. And maybe, again, he was trying to bring in, rein in these, these Christians. You see, the more evil tries to stamp out the truth, usually what they succeed in doing is making it spread farther. That's the reason why the Lord brings persecution. That's the reason why He brings trial. That's why He allows some of His children even to suffer martyrdom. It's been said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church because it encourages people when they see somebody standing up for the truth who is willing to give their life for it, they're encouraged to also do the same themselves. Is it any wonder then that the Lord brings persecution? It's, it's a part of our lives and we need to count on it and not necessarily pray that the Lord would remove it. 
So Saul went to the high priests and he asked for letters authorizing him to go to Damascus and to arrest and bring back to Jerusalem anyone he might find there belonging to the way. And the way was simply an early way in which Christianity was described. They were people of the way. Uh, receiving these letters, then Saul sets out for Damascus. And now this is where we run into basically a, an example of conversion, how the Lord does it. And what happens next, we need to realize, is in some regards typical or the usual way that God works, but there's also some extraordinary things happening here, things that we would say are atypical or unusual. It's typical that the Lord will always do something to get our attention, but it's atypical, in this case, in the way He did it, and that's because of what it is that the Lord was preparing Paul to do, to be an apostle. Now, first of all, we see something atypical, we see something extraordinary, something unusual. The Lord did not convert him through the preaching of the gospel, at least in the usual way. He didn't send somebody to him to preach to him. Actually, Saul would have probably killed him on the spot or at least arrested him and taken him back to Jerusalem. He, so he didn't do it the way he did with the Ethiopian official, sending somebody like Philip. But rather, he did it through a visible representation of the gospel. He appears to him personally as he was approaching Damascus. You know, our Lord is not bound to any particular method of converting people, any particular place in which He converts people. You don't have to be in a church, you know, no particular time. It doesn't have to be the first time they hear. It could be the hundredth time. You know, the Lord is not bound when He saves, where He saves. He does that when and where He wills. I'm reminded of a story of a man I heard about, or I think read about, or maybe I heard, I'm not sure exactly where the story came to me, and maybe Dick can remind me because I think he's the one who told me, but a man who heard the gospel when he was in his teens, I think it was John Flavel he heard preaching, who many years later was unconverted, lived his whole life, was working out in the fields in his 80s, and suddenly he remembered that sermon that John Flavel preached, and the Lord converted him. See, the Lord saves when and where and how He chooses. He chooses the time, and that should give us hope that even though we've shared the gospel with our children, even though we've shared the gospel perhaps with others, we haven't seen them changed, that doesn't mean that what we've done is never going to bear fruit. There can always be that fruit because the Lord is merciful. Now, as Saul was approaching Damascus to arrest and imprison and ultimately exterminate the Christians who were there, the Lord stops him in his tracks. You know, Jesus often gets involved when things begin to take a darker turn for his church. I think that's the way things work in history. Remember in, in the case of David and Goliath, when it looked like nobody was going to be able to stand up against Goliath, the champion of the Philistines, or to resist this Philistine army, the Lord sends a young man who is armed with a sling and five smooth stones to kill the giant, very unlikely hero. When it looked like Christianity was vanishing from the Western culture, and oddly enough, or maybe interestingly enough, because of the Enlightenment, which was taking place in Europe, the Lord sent one of the greatest revivals He ever had sent into the world, the Great Awakening. You know, that's one thing that I wasn't aware of. Those things were taking place at the same time. So while the devil is locking people into darkness, the, the Lord's kingdom is, as it were, fighting back. God sends this revival. And I think as we look at the world around us today, again, things are becoming increasingly dark and we are ripe for another revival. We should never lose hope. This is the way the Lord operates. It's not always light and glory, is it? It's usually darkness before the dawn. And we need to remember that and pray that God might be pleased to send uh, the dawn, as it were, in the darkness of our culture. Well, the Lord not, didn't just stop him. The Lord appeared to him. Ananias tells us in verse 17. Now, that was also unusual. The Lord does not usually appear to people that He saves. But in this case, it was necessary. Those who would be the Lord's apostles have to have seen the risen Lord. They have to be witnesses of His resurrection. 
you know, Paul was not there with the disciples as they walked around with Jesus for those three and a half years. He didn't have the benefit of all of that. He was essentially a Pharisee. He knew the Old Testament pretty well. But he did have the benefit of seeing the, resur the resurrected Christ, and that made him a witness of the resurrection. And that is essentially what an apostle is, a witness of the resurrection. He's more than that, of course. There's only 12 of them, uh, at least most would believe. Uh, but he had to see Jesus. Now, when he sees him, his appearance, was so, his, his appearance was so glorious with a brightness that outshone the sun that it forced Saul to the ground. Now, he was probably on horseback and got knocked off his horse. You know, every time we see the Lord Jesus after his ascension, he appears with this radiant glory, brighter than the sun. That is a part of his reward for glorifying his Father while he was on earth, that he would receive this glory. And that glory is not just the shining, you know, brightness and effulgence of our Lord, but it's also a kingdom and a people that he will have forever and ever. Now, Saul also heard him say this, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And wanting to know who was speaking to him, but perhaps having some inkling of who it might be, he asked, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, another lesson we learn from the Bible and we learn from church history is basically this. <clears throat> the greater the service that our Lord is calling us to, the greater He will humble us before He calls us to that service. The Lord will not use us if we are prideful, if we are arrogant. He reserves His grace for the humble. You know, one thing that... If you read the, um, you know, the, the biographies of, of some of the greatest heroes of the faith, you'll see that, that that inevitably happens. Think about Martin Luther and how the Lord humbled him to the ground and how he, you know, he was virtually prostrate before the Lord looking for a way to be free from his sins and how he would actually take a whip and he'd whip himself in his cell and deny himself food and water trying to be free from the guilt of these sins or even George Whitfield. Before the Lord saved him, he fasted one time for such a long time that his, his physician thought he would die. Apparently, his skin color changed. He looked like he had, he had wasted away. He couldn't even get back up the stairs into his room, but the Lord spared his life. And after that humbling and then his being reinvigorated, the Lord saved him and then used him very powerfully. The Lord humbles us by His grace that He might use us. And once He does that and begins to use us, He continues to humble us so that we will continue to be usable. Remember how Paul will later say that he was repeatedly attacked by a messenger of Satan to keep him humble and usable after all the privileges that the Lord had given to him, all the things He had shown him. Now notice again what Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In attacking the church, Saul was actually assaulting Jesus because the church is his body. The church are his people. They, it is his people. The, the church is his bride. Jesus tells us in other places, whatever we do for his brethren, we are doing for him. But the opposite is also true. Whatever we do to the least of our brethren, we're also doing to him. Whoever touches the church is actually touching Jesus. Saul had been attacking the church, trying to kill it. And in doing so, he was attacking Jesus. And Jesus took it, obviously, personally. Now, what do you think Saul felt at that particular moment where this one whom he thought was, was a fiction, just a, a Jewish man who was deluded, uh, who these disciples claimed to be alive and whom he believed was actually dead, what do you think he felt when he was standing before the risen, glorified Jesus being accused of attacking him. Well, he was likely feeling some guilt, perhaps fear, perhaps terror of judgment. Now, here is what I would suggest is Saul's awakening. Okay, He was certainly, I think, the Lord got his attention here. And this is a part of conversion that is typical. The Lord always gets our attention before He converts us. And He does it by making us feel, not just the reality, 
but the weight of our guilt and that guiltiness, also the weight of judgment. And he shows us our guilt by showing us the holiness or the perfect love that he requires in his law. And I think that's what he was doing here. Because think about this for a minute. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God in human flesh, the eternal Son of God, right? And what does the law call us to do with regard to God? Well, Saul knew that he was supposed to love God with his whole heart, his mind, his soul, and his strength, and his neighbor as himself. And he knew that what he had done instead at that moment was that he had attacked God and tried to destroy him. What kind of fear must that have struck within his heart? Well, obviously, it awakened Saul. He realized the danger that he was in. Now he knew his condition. And I think we would have to say, at this point, he gave up any further idea of persecuting the church. Instead, he, he submitted, and he asked the Lord what he should do. Now, was Saul converted at this point? We don't really know, but he was certainly, again, awake. Jesus told him to enter the city that there he would be told what he was to do. So Saul got up. He found that he was blind. Why was he blind? Well, maybe it made it easier for people to lead him. Maybe he wasn't altogether changed yet. Maybe he still posed a threat. We don't know. Maybe the Lord was showing him his spiritual condition. Okay, Saul, you thought you could see. You were a Pharisee. You, you thought you were better than other people, but you're actually blind to everything. I was trying to teach you. You were blind to the beauty and the glory of the Lord. Okay, if his eyes had been opened as a Pharisee, he never would have attacked Jesus. Instead, he would have done everything he could to promote his kingdom. So those who were with him led him into the city where he remained blind for three days, during which time, of course, he fasted. Now, again, if he was converted, would he be fasting? You know, we don't fast when everything is going well. When all of our sins have rolled off our back and we feel liberated from the guilt that was ours before we came to know Jesus Christ, we fast when things aren't going well. And I think perhaps um, that may have been the case here. You know, remember when Jesus said to John's disciples when they asked him why they, that is John's disciples and the Pharisees fast, but his disciples don't fast. Jesus said they couldn't fast as long as the bridegroom was with them. The days would come when he would be taken away, and then they would fast. When things get difficult, that's when we fast. Things had gotten difficult for Saul. He was afraid of God's judgment. He was fasting and seeking the Lord. And that's what awakening is meant to do. It's meant to turn us away from the path we were going, which was down the broad road to destruction. It's meant to turn us around and to seek the Lord for his mercies. It, it appears as though perhaps the Lord gave Saul a few days to think about this before he brought him to saving faith. You know, Jonathan Edwards once said that God does not save people who are completely, you know, um, disinterested in salvation. He makes them interested first, and that's what awakening is all about, to show them their need. And so he doesn't allow himself to be found by those who necessarily aren't seeking him, but he does something to get them to begin going the right direction. So Saul is going the right direction. He's fasting and seeking the Lord. And then we see the Lord mercifully answers his prayer. So secondly, we see Saul's conversion. And again, I'm not saying this is the absolute only way to interpret where the conversion takes place, but certainly is one. While Saul was praying, the Lord spoke to Ananias, who was also in Damascus, and told him to go to the street that was named Straight, to the house of Judas, not Iscariot, um, to, and to ask for a man named Saul, because he had shown Saul in a vision that he would come, Ananias would come, and lay hands on him that he might see. Now put yourself in Ananias' place, right? He wasn't too comfortable with this plan. He says in verses 13 and 14, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Lord, this man is the driving force behind the persecution in Jerusalem, and now he has come to arrest every Christian he finds. You want me to go and talk to him? 
Ananias wasn't sure that he really wanted to be in the same room with him. I mean, it's like saying, you know, the Lord gives you a vision, and let's say you're back in World War II, and he says, I want you to go to Hitler and lay your hands on him. You know, I mean, how would you feel about that? Okay, well, I don't think we feel too great about that. How could someone who is that evil, who hates the Lord this much, how could he ever change? How could he not harm me? What are you asking me to do here, Lord? Well, humanly speaking, you see, that's all that Saul could do. He, had, he could not really change his heart any more than Hitler could change his heart, any more than Jeremiah writes the Ethiopian the color of his skin or the leopard his spots. But Jesus tells us what is impossible for man is possible with God. Paul later writes, as we already read in Ephesians chapter 2, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were living like everybody else in the world, going that direction, which is what Saul was doing. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, which means we had no love at all for Him, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, gave us love for Christ so that we would trust Him. And so the Lord says to Ananias, go, for He is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. You know, in this case, Ananias was not like Philip, where, where the angel said, Philip, go, go over here, and Philip just went. The Lord says to Ananias, go to where Saul is, and Ananias says, wait a minute, you know. So, not without question, but I think we see a difference here, don't we? Because Philip didn't expect to find the world's greatest church hater on the road to Damascus, though he may, or excuse me, on the, the road to Gaza, though he may very well have done that. But Ananias knows whom he's going to face. And so the Lord, in this case, very mercifully comforts Ananias and assures him, you're not going to get hurt, okay? Don't be afraid. It's my plan to save him and use him to reach the Gentiles. Now, again, the point here is we do not choose the Lord, right? The Lord chooses us. Jesus said to His disciples in John 15, 16, You did not choose Me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. The Lord had chosen Saul to bring His gospel to the Gentiles. You know, now that basically Judea and Samaria had been taken care of by the disciples dispersed because of Saul's persecution, the Lord was now preparing to turn to the Gentiles so that He might provoke His people, the Jews, to jealousy so that they might receive Christ, and He needed somebody to do it. And Saul would be the one who would do it. I mean, if you were trying to pick out somebody in that situation to be the one who who was going to be the one to do this, do you think Saul would have been the one you would choose? Do you think he would be the one most likely to do this? But yet, this is the one the Lord chose. Again, purely out of His mercy. Saul was certainly industrious, to be sure, and perhaps the Lord was wanting to turn that energy in this other direction. But again, we would have to say it really even wasn't because of that, because God chooses purely of His own grace and mercy. Saul would go to the Gentiles. Saul would appear before kings. Saul would also go to the Jewish people. He always went to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And in the course of his labors, he would suffer a great deal. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. You know, I used to read that passage and think, the Lord was getting back at Saul for all the damage he did to his church. I'm going to make him suffer now. No, that, that's not what's happening here. Saul uh, is not going to be punished for what he had done to the church. And why not? Because Jesus was already punished for what Saul did to the church. Because he was also punished for everything we have done as well. Jesus cancels out all of our sins. Now, what he meant by this was this, that Saul would be hated by all just as everyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You know, when you live the Christian life, it doesn't make you the most popular person on the face of the earth. As a matter of fact, it makes you one of the least popular people 
People will hate you because you're like Jesus. Why is it oftentimes that Christians aren't hated by unbelievers? Well, it's either because the Lord is restraining the unbeliever or it's because the, the Christian isn't living like a Christian. If you say the things that the Lord calls you to say and do the things the Lord calls you to do, people are going to hate you. And I think those few Christian leaders who are willing actually to speak the truth actually are hated by the unbeliever, but they are loved by God's people because they love to see people doing what the Lord has called them to do. Well, Ananias went, laid his hands on Saul, prayed for him. Something like scales fell from his eyes. And here we see Luke's, you know, observation. He's a physician. He'd be interested in those scales. What, what were those things? So he makes note of that. And then Saul could see. And it could be that perhaps the return of his physical sight was symbolic of the fact that he could now see spiritually. Remember before as a Pharisee, he thought he could see. He thought he could see better than most what God loves and what he desires. And he was the one who was full of insight. But now that his eyes were opened by the Lord, he knew that he had been blind. He thought he could see, but now he could really see. And then he got up and he was baptized. Our Lord tells us that those who believe are to receive the mark of His covenant on Himself. And so He ate and was strengthened, and as we'll see next week, He immediately went to work for His Lord. And again, our lives immediately change when the Lord saves us. And I'd say there's a remarkable change in Saul, wouldn't you? <laughs> I mean, he, he goes from wanting to kill the Christians in Damascus to beginning to preach Christ in Damascus, okay, <laughs> that's, that's a radical change, but that's the difference between life and death. He was dead, and now he's alive, and that was not a choice that Saul made. People cannot do, you know, again, as our Lord reminds us, even as we can't change our skin color, our eye color, our hair color, a leopard can't change his spots. We who are accustomed to doing evil cannot choose to do good. God has to change our hearts. So, in closing, let me just remind us of, of three things, what we've seen here. The Lord always awakens before He converts, okay? Somebody needs to know why they need a Savior before they're ever going to reach out for the Savior. And that's why law comes before grace. That's why we need to explain God's law to them. They need to know they've broken it. They need to know what the consequences are. They need to know the danger. If, they, if they're not in any danger, why would they look for some way out, okay? Secondly, we see here the Lord is able to save even the worst of men. You know, people we would never expect God to save. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, obviously the Lord didn't save Hitler, but he would be on my list of people less like, you know, least likely to be saved. But yet the Lord is able to save even those kinds of people. I mean, look at um, Saul. He wanted to commit genocide too, although in this case it was more of a spiritual genocide. He wanted to kill every Christian. Saul hated the church. He tried to destroy it, but yet the Lord had mercy on him. And again, the reason was to encourage others that they also can be saved. Okay? You, you, we shouldn't look at anyone or even, you know, if, if we should think ourselves to be unsaved because we think we're too bad to be saved... We're never too far out of the reach of God's grace, especially if we're concerned. If we're unconcerned about it, maybe we are out of the reach of His grace because there is that, um, that point to which a person can go so far that God gives them up forever. Yeah, the Bible talks about that. But if you're at all concerned, you are not outside of the reach of the Lord. And then thirdly, only the Lord can actually change the heart. Remember, it wasn't because Jesus knocked Saul off his horse to the ground or the fact that he saw the risen Christ in all of his glory that he believed. Because there were many, many people who saw the miracles of Jesus, who saw things extraordinary that, that shook them to the core. They were astonished. They were amazed. The word actually means terrified by what Jesus was able to do. And yet people who saw him do these things, many of them hated him more after he did them. So... Seeing a miracle does not change your heart. It doesn't change who you are. Saul believed only because God had mercy on him. He was dead, 
but the Lord gave him life. He raised him to life. He made him alive and gave him the ability to trust in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, after Jesus told his disciples that it would be easier for a literal camel to go through the small eyelet of a literal needle than those who are most likely to enter the kingdom of heaven actually to enter it, and that would be the rich who had the money and the leisure time really to seek the Lord, they asked the question, then who can be saved? I think they were thinking about themselves. Can we be saved if the rich man can't be saved? But Jesus answered in this way. He said, with men it is impossible. No one can save themselves, certainly not by their works, but they can't even come to Jesus, okay? With men it is impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. So the point is, there is, you know, when God chooses to save, He's going to save and only He can do it. God can and will save His people. He will save His people. He can do it and He will do it. And we need to remember that as we share the gospel with others, that God is going to bring His people to faith in, in Him through His Son, the Lord Jesus. Well... As I told you, this part of it was um, long. That's why we're not going into section three. But at this point, let's just bow and let's, again, thank the Lord for His mercy upon us. Let's ask the Lord to encourage us through this to be more open with the gospel as He gives us opportunities and, again, to build those relationships through which we might be able to share Christ and, and particularly as we prepare to come to the Lord's table. Let's pray.